Good afternoon. We have an audience of 5,000 today. Most of you were here in the morning. It is amazing that you are still so refreshed and excited. We're all here to listen to His Holiness, the 14th Dalai Lama. In, in this morning, the Dalai Lama captured, totally captured our minds by speaking on the nature of mind. This afternoon, he will talk about another fascinating topic on ethics for our time. I'm extremely honored to take this opportunity to sincerely thank our community friends, our donors, uh, my own colleagues, and our vibrant students for your support, which led to the success of today's big event. I would like to acknowledge my special colleague who invited the Dalai Lama. He's a former translator for the Dalai Lama, and he holds the Dalai Lama endowed chair in Tibetan Buddhism and Cultural Studies, Professor Jose Cabazon. I would also like to recognize our Executive Dean of the College of Letters and Science, David Marshall. Dean Marshall has been a strong promoter for this event, every step along the way, Dean Marshall. We feel so fortunate to have the opportunity to learn from Dalai Lama today and to be inspired by his message and his scholarship. The Dalai Lama, is an incomparable Buddhist teacher. In every aspect of his life, he embodies the principles he teaches. Perhaps the best way to describe these principles is to remember that he was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1989. I, I might take this opportunity to mention that UC Santa Barbara is known for our Nobel laureates. And among the audience today, we have Nobel laureates in physics, in chemistry, and in economics, all here today to welcome His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Could my colleague raise, raise your hand when you're here? <laughs> To introduce the Dalai Lama, we are honored to have with us the chairman of our University of California Board of Regents, Richard Blum. Richard Blum is the founder and the chairman of the American Himalayan Foundation. Uh, the, the focus of this nonprofit organization is on providing education and health care, as well as supporting cultural and environmental preservations for the Himalayan region. So I will now invite Dean Marshall to make some remarks regarding our academic program at UC Santa Barbara, and then Regent Blum will introduce His Holiness the Dalai Lama. On behalf of the College of Letters and Science and UC Santa Barbara, I'm honored to welcome His Holiness to our campus, not only as a spiritual leader and head of state, but also and especially as one of the great teachers of our time. His teaching resonates with the tenets of a liberal arts education. Inquiry, critical analysis, creative engagement, reflection, communication, the discovery and dissemination of knowledge, enlightenment. As a public university, we seek to educate our students to be citizens in the 21st century global society that California has become. And in recent years, we have become acutely aware that this global society demands an understanding of two often neglected areas of study, religion, or the diverse cultural traditions and beliefs that animate it, and ethics, the complex dialogue of meaning and value that informs our responses and responsibilities to each other and ourselves. We're proud to have a premier department of religious studies in the Division of Humanities and Fine Arts. It's known internationally for its interdisciplinary and comparative scope, as well as its program in Buddhist studies. Just over a decade ago, 
thanks to many people here today, we were honored to establish the 14th Dalai Lama Endowed Chair in Tibetan Buddhism and Cultural Studies, and then to appoint as its first incumbent a distinguished scholar, Professor Jose Cabizan. Under Professor Cabizan's guidance, our curriculum in this area now includes the study of religious and philosophical texts, Tibetan language, culture, art, and literature, and the rich intercultural dialogue that makes Tibetan Buddhism such an interesting interlocutor in the dialogues that give life to meaning. These contexts, including the public forums of our arts and lecture series, our university art museum Tonka exhibit, our library UCSB Reads selection of ethics for the new millennium, have turned our campus and our community into the ideal classroom for the lectures that we are privileged to hear today. And now Mr. Richard Blum, Chair of the Board of Regents of the University of California, will introduce His Holiness. Thank you. Thank you, Your Holiness, President uh, Chancellor Yang. Um, you know, it, it's a bit of a problem because most of you were here to mor this morning and I had a few pretty good lines and I don't know whether I should repeat them or not. Uh, but l let me just say this. It, it, a day like this is totally unique for me because the two things I probably care most about are the University of California and the Tibetan people. and. Uh, having been associated with them both for longer than most of you here, I think, have been alive. Anyhow, it, this is a unique day. Um, the university has had a long-standing relationship with His Holiness, uh, and particularly UCSB. And um, the first professorship of the Dalai Lama studies was here. Um, His Holiness is going to visit uh, two campuses. Uh, here in that smaller place up in Berkeley tomorrow. <laughs> and as I said before, uh, uh, as chairman of the Board of Regents, it's supposed to be even-handed, and I did go to school at Berkeley, but when it comes to Tibetan Buddhist studies, there's no place like UC Santa Barbara. I'd be remiss if there isn't somebody that I forgot to introduce before, but I really must introduce her because she is the president of the American Himalayan Foundation, which runs 175 projects throughout the Himalayan region, of which half of them are for Tibetans. Erica Stone, where are you? You here? Well, one of the great honors and privileges of my life is to have known His Holiness for 35 years. Uh, as some of you may know, in 1978, my wife, Senator Dianne Feinstein, and I visited Dharamsala to invite His Holiness to come to the United States. Uh, when he arrived in, I think, June of 1979, it was his first visit to the United States. Um, the Chinese didn't want him to come then. Uh, he did uh, come then, and he's been coming virtually every year, sometimes twice a year since then. Um, as someone, this, I didn't talk about this before, but I, I really feel a necessity to say this. Um, my wife and I and many others have, uh, where we've been able to talked to the Chinese leadership for a long period of time, tried to reconcile the differences. Um, what the Tibetans are asking is very little, just to preserve their culture, to have an opportunity uh, to be educated and to live their lives. The one thing that I must say uh, to our Chinese friends is that oppression there's never a final solution. Lies don't live forever. And one thing that they can't deny is that they have been unwilling to meet with His Holiness 
for over 50 years. Their answer to that is, well, we don't really trust His Holiness, but they'll meet with Kim Jong-il, they'll meet with Mugabe, they'll meet with every other dictator around. And for those of you, and there are many uh, Chinese friends in the audience, uh, to the extent that you have relationships and you can encourage uh, the regime of, uh, in, in Beijing to enter into a real dialogue, we would appreciate it. In the meantime, uh, with the American Himalayan Foundation, the international campaign for Tibet, we will continue to support the Tibetans whenever we can. Um, I have uh, followed his holiness since he was a very young man. Of course, I was a very young man at the same time. As I mentioned earlier, um, we were reincarnated at virtually the same time in in July of, uh, I'd like to say 1955, but everybody knows that's not true. <laughs> uh, and um, the, the difference, of course, is we know who His Holiness was in his last life. He was the 13th Dalai Lama, a great man, and he has uh, certainly lived on in his tradition and inspires people from around the world like no other person that I know. My problem is that um, I did something bad in my last life <laughs> and was reincarnated an investment banker. <laughs> so been between, between the Regents and the American Himalayan Foundation, I've been trying to clean up my act. <laughs> In any event, you didn't come here to listen to me. Um, you came here to listen to His Holiness. So without uh, further word, Your Holiness. Thank you. <clears throat> Dear brothers and sisters, When I say, brothers, sisters, I really feel like that. Uh, particularly, this moment, we really need that spirit. And they are usual concept, we and they, is, I think, outdated concept. Now we must have a concept that take entire humanity as our brothers, sisters, and then should consider part of we. That's much better. Because there are many problems which are facing. Essentially, man-made problem. That's really unnecessary. On top of nature, because of the problem. Uh, is quite enough. The additional man-made problem, is it wise? Certainly not. So all these, I think ultimately, are concept we and they. And don't bother about their interest, about them. And worst thing, no hesitation to exploit on them. Cheat, no. cheat on them. So therefore, uh, I always, I say, uh, telling people, now we need a sense of global responsibility. Think, six million humanity equal. Just think oneself. Uh, it's actually foolish. Every hour um, sort of move, suppose bring happy life, 
no one deliberately carrying some work, some action in order to bring problem or suffering. So everybody is moving with intention to bring happier days. But then because just think of oneself and don't care about other, so they, because of that kind of motivation, the our action become then unrealistic, wrong action. As a result, these unwanted problems essentially created by ourselves. So therefore, uh, we really need a uh, healthy, proper mental attitude. I think that's very important. I think we pay adequate sort of attention about material development, about material values. Uh, compare that, we pay much, much less, 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 attention. Uh, less attention about our inner value, about, about our mind. So therefore, now I think uh, out of our past experience uh, in 20th century, we invented many, many advanced things in, in technology with the help of science development. So, but sometimes uh, some technology bring more fear, more anxiety. Uh, so now, uh, judging from our experience which we gain in 20th century, now we are in 21st century. I think out of our past experience, now we have to think, uh, what is wrong? Essentially, not working. Just, just, just okay now. Uh, so the, what I'm saying, I forget now. Uh, uh. Oh, yes, matter. It's matter. No mind. Isn't it? Uh, so the matter utilized by human being, that means ultimately matter used by mind. Something like that, isn't it? And then the very matter of happiness joyfulness is kind of mind. Mental state. Mental, mental, mental state. Mental state. Mental feeling. And similarly, pains and, oh, of course, this I mentioned this morning. So apologize, I repeat that. <laughs> so the pains and sadness, these things also, mental feeling. So, recently in Damsala, on our science meeting, I mentioned uh, it's quite sort of uh, strange. Uh, the very basis of pains, pains and pressure, that's mind. Now, we're much sort of eager to gain more because of the pleasure, more joyfulness, and we try um, the, uh, as much as we can reduce pains. But the pains and pleasure itself is mental sort of states. Mental states. But we neglect about what is mind. Obviously, I think many people, I think, have the same experience. The, with facility, good facility of matter, material. Uh, but meantime, um, as a person, very unhappy person. I notice 
some my friend. Not Richard Blum. <laughs> it's some very rich, I think, very rich. Uh, but as a person, very unhappy person. What's wrong? Plenty of money. And with money, and usually, suddenly, more friend. But actually, it's questionable. These friends are truly friend of human being, or friend to friend of the person. The friend to person, or friend to money. That's a question, questionable. In any way, usually you see the, the richer uh, people, or oh, have some more friend uh, like that. Uh, but in spite of that, this person, very unhappy person. So then, uh, sometimes these people are still seeking comfort out of money, out of power. It's wrong. Uh, if they pay more attention about our inner value, inner science, then most probably they may find more effective way to face their unhappiness. What do you think? Some sense? <laughs> oh. Thank you. Oh. I think this, uh, at this point, I think I can, uh, I can tell my own experience. The very time, uh, the time of my birth, uh, 1935. Five. Five. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so at that time, about to start a Nazi sort of power in Europe, in Germany. Then soon, Second World War start. Then, uh, Korean War, Vietnam War, uh, like that. So, my life, whole my life, witness too much violence. And also some violence in the name of revolution. Uh, I think most, uh, most cases fail to bring real happy world, healthy world. Still, a lot of fear, distrust, uncomfortable, uncertainty, still there. So that, quite clear, the material value fail to bring real healthy world. And family level also. As the Blum mentioned, since 79, uh, quite often they come here. And also Europe. So among my friend, one time they had one wife, the next time Another wife. <laughs> then next time, another wife. <laughs> so, happy marriage and divorce. Again, marry, divorce. <laughs> so, those people who have no children, then okay, better. Uh, enjoy short moment, then forget, then f try find <laughs> another one. <laughs> okay, doesn't matter. <laughs> if not thinking seriously about moral principle. <laughs> But then with children, it's really, uh, really tragedy. Now oh, this is children. Children sort of entire their sort of trust, relying on their parent. 
and divided. I think sad. So these things also is a sign of some problem in the family level also. And then from time to time some unbelievable sort of incident, shooting in classroom, innocent sort of student. Also sign of something lacking. And like Japan, I was told, it is growing number among students take suicide. So one time in America, we have some meeting uh, about the uh, problem among the youth. youth. There are uh, some, some medical scientists, <laughs> some educationists, psychologists. some socialists. Uh, social, um, social workers. Social workers. Psychologists. Um, ah. Psychologists. Oh, psychologists. Uh, at, the, at that meeting, almost unanimous sort of, sort of conclusion this problem because lack of affection in the family, in the, en in the environment. So now in China, people talk about China. As far as material thing is concerned, now rapidly developing. But there are uh, quite a number of cases of mental, you know, mental problem. So therefore, and then is my own sort of now case. And then, uh, at the age 16 year, I lost freedom and remain constant fear, suspicion, difficult. Except short period, 54, I went to Peking, uh, and few months, I remained there, I stayed there, and I had several meetings with Chairman Mao, and of course, uh, most of the leaders at that time, uh, I had a sort of meeting. Uh, as a result of these sort of meeting with these people, these leaders, are genuine revolutionary. Their whole life truly dedicated for the well-being of the people especially working class people. Wonderful. Then, uh, particularly Chairman Mao, uh, at that time, so I really developed genuine respect and admiration uh, about his sort of work for revolution. And many party member, many of them, the member of Long March. So really dedicated. So then in 55, I returned from Peking. So on the road, I met General Tang Guo Hua. Uh, he's the sort of in our autonomous sort of preparatory committee, uh, he was the deputy chairman. So on the road, he come from Lhasa to go to Peking. I come back from Peking on the road in Kongbo area, we met. But then I told him, last year, when I coming the same road, coming to Peking, my mind full of suspicion, fear, doubt. Now I'm coming back full of confidence. So then that feeling till uh, 56. So except that period is a constant fear. Then, age 
24, I lost my own country. The last 50 years now. Still a lot of problem, a lot of sadness, a lot of heartbreaking news. During this period, money uh, failed to bring peace of mind. Uh, so the consort, uh, uh, consolation. Consolation. Yeah. Of course, I love you to watch. So some beautiful watch also failed to bring inner comfort. Uh, and also occasionally some dogs and some cats, very beautiful. But they also fail to bring inner peace. Uh, sometimes my human friend, sometimes even greater sort of sadness. They also complain, they also express their sort of sadness. Then <laughs> instead of sorry, bring peace, but more worry. <laughs> but then only thing which bring inner peace is my own inner value, compassion, and the spirit of forgiveness, and also realistic attitude. These things bring inner comfort, clear. And my physical health also, these inner value really effect positively on my health ha huh? on my health no? oh, on my health. health health so you know i think many of you uh, may not know uh, the last year uh, i had uh, i went to surgery uh, to remove uh, sir, gold bladder gold bladder uh, so at that time, one uh, specialist, the surgeon specialist, uh, there are a few sort of specialists. You see, they, uh, one specialist described me as a young patient. Then I told him, I'm not young. Now, uh, over 73 years old. So then he says, yes, I know your age. Uh, 73, over 73, but your body looks six, still like 60, 60 year old. So he described as a young patient. <laughs> mm. So that uh, shows my mental peace, uh, inner sort of strength. I think really makes differences about body element. So we are same, same human being. Therefore, I want to share you ultimate source of your happy life, as a happy mental state, is within yourself. That I think you should know. So now the question, Kusa, drop it, Kusa. Ethics, ethics for our time, no? Ethics for our time. Now, ethics, in this context, ethics is just a universal value. Uh, ethics, there are many levels. According religion, according different religion, there's a different sort of concept of ethics. of ethics. So some people, uh, some of my friends actually uh, uh, believe the moral ethics must be based on religious faith. I do not think that, that way. Yes, every religion, you see, based on their own sort of ethics, and that very much related with faith. But generally, 
as I mentioned earlier, universal value. That kind of ethics, not based on religion. Now we can judge among dogs or cats. Some are quite peaceful. So uh, some are quite wrathful. Aggressive. So we, some extent we can say uh, some of these dogs are more peaceful, more compassionate, so more ethical. They have nothing to do with religion. Uh, and then also, the kind, peaceful, even young children, two years, three years, five years, we can, we can see some are more gentle, some are more because of that. Aggressive. Aggressive. So these, nothing to do with religion. So therefore, and then also I think the most important, I feel, I think everybody agree, and also whether Easterner or Westerner, or whether Chinese or Indian or Japanese or European, I think everybody appreciate others' affection, human love, kindness. And now, most important, the medical scientists, they now begin to recognize the peace of mind is a very, very crucial factor for healthy body and also as a preventive measure, peace of mind is very, very important. Uh, so therefore, uh, everybody more or less agree importance of love and compassion. Now, among the humanity, six billion human beings, I feel, if not majority, at least a major portion of humanity, I don't think it's really very serious about religion. I don't think. They may claim, I'm Christian, I'm Buddhist, I'm Hindu, I'm Muslim. But real life, dead real life, not much bother about religion. And those people who are in the synagogue or church or mosque, a short moment seems very serious. But outside, then just usual human being. <laughs> Not much differences, isn't it? So one my friend, who actually is a co-author, oh, yeah, I, I don't think, it's without his permission, I cannot sort of mention his name. <laughs> oh, one, my friend, uh, my friend, uh, one time we discussed about ethics, moral ethics in business field. Then, uh, then I told him, oh, God-fearing also, you see, uh, something very important. Then he answered, oh, concept of God-fearing is 18th century. Uh, now not much. Sort of effect. The importance, right? No, effect. Ka. Effect. Not much effect. He told me like that. So I think we Buddhists also, when there are oh, some Buddhist monks here also, we Tibetan, Tibetan Buddhist monks also here. <laughs> so we sometimes, you see, we preach other people contentment, but in our own house, oh, we need a lot of articles. <laughs> <laughs> so that also, the indication we are not that much serious. <laughs> right. So therefore, now a large portion of humanity not much bother about religion. But these also human being, part of human being, important part of humanity. So we must find ways and means to reach these people about importance of moral ethics. Then we must find more secular way to carry message of ethics. ethics. So that I usually call universal value. Whether religious minded 
or non non religious minded uh, no difference that no difference uh, no differences so my now again i want to make clear um among my friend uh, some people uh, have great reservation the secular ethics uh because uh, they consider secular means the very meaning of secular is some kind of rejection or disrespect about religion uh but in india india's constitution itself based on secularism and mahatma gandhi and some other sort of leaders they they are uh their way of thinking is very very secular way but meantime very religious minded so when i say secular does not mean rejection or disrespect religion but rather respect all religions and no preference about this religion or that religion equal equally respect so that's meaning according some in, according some indian, indian that's the meaning of secular so when i talk secular ethics this is the meaning uh, with that meaning this is the hmm. meaning so so i usually call the the affection human compassion these are uh, universal value and these some extent bio, biological factor so itself is a secular ethics the way to approach promote that also secular way without touching religion simply use our common experience common sense and scientific findings one important we come from our mother all i think few thousand people here all come from our mother and the at very young age i think except a few cases otherwise i think one's own mother take fullest care and provide us maximum affection that's the way and mother's milk that's the way we survived we grown up so we can see those children who at a young age who experienced fullest care from mother their mind their mental state as well as the physical state their education everything much more smooth then most important rest of their life they can show affection to other whole re- whole life remain more kinder person kind hearted person then those children who at early age lack of mother's care and sometimes even abuse then these children physically also suffer mentally also suffer and most important rest of their life always remain cold and difficult to respond to other suffering right when they saw right. other suffer. suffer sometimes there's no feel not much feeling about other's pain then easily kill like that so that's our common experience just at press meeting i mentioned is my own case and uh, uh, occasionally i mentioned my own case the uh, my mother just a villager as a villager sort of women farmer no education illiteracy illiterate illiterate ah illiterate ah illiterate yeah illiterate ah but a very very kind one so sometimes i feel uh 
at that time, of course, uh, my part, no appreciation of my mother's kindness. Even I manipulate, I think I take advantage. So the, at the press, I, I mentioned, I said, that my mother's kindness actually, in a way, spoiled me. So I become more aggressive. Uh, you know, my mother, you see, often you see, carry me on, on the shoulder, shoulder. Right? shoulder. Then uh, I hold. hold my mother's ear. Mm -hmm. I want to this side, go that. <laughs> and this side. <laughs> so, so one young boy, such a sort of stupid <laughs> oh, bully on own, one's own mother. <laughs> so I think my mother's kindness a little bit spoil me. So now, now later, now these days, I really feel, oh, I have certain amount of compassion that actually the seed which I received from my mother, that's the seed of today's my compassion. So I really feel grateful to my mother. So all, everybody, hmm? everybody, uh, generally speaking, is the same sort of experience. So we, everybody, uh, come our, our, our life, begin our life, uh, begin our life under mother's affection. So, uh, now here, the affection, in some extent, or affection here, I usually make distinction. Love, compassion, affection, biased one, and unbiased one. Biased one, limited. Unbiased one, infinite. The biased one, it's more simultaneous. Spontaneous. Because spontaneous. Spontaneous. And that very much related with biological factor. Biological factor. Uh, because for survival, that affection is a need. So we can see birds, dogs, cats, all these, their offspring survival of their offspring at young age entirely depend on others' care. So therefore, the affection from biological factor comes. Uh, then those animals, such as uh, turtles, and also butterfly, these flies, you see, their survival not depend on mother's care. So, there is no affection. I often tell him, uh, and wish some experiment, some investigation, those uh, turtle mother uh, lay down, egg, then left. No kasoda. Uh, Never meeting. Uh, that's nature. Nature's, nature created that way. So therefore, the young turtle, if we put together young turtle and the, their mother put together, I don't think either side have the capacity to show affection. Because not necessary. The rest of mammals, which their survival entirely depend on others' care, then affection comes. Because affection brings energy. Energy brings, sort of what's it, the action, even sacrifice their own life for the sake of their children. So this is biological factor. But biological factor, spontaneous sort of affection, that is limited. And everybody at a young age, 
He said, we very much appreciate that. Then grown up uh, and our intelligence become gr greater, greater, greater. The basic human good quality then become uh, less and less. Uh, not, not balanced. And then the aggressiveness take the upper hand. And the basic human uh, good quality then become weak. So now here we need effort out of awareness. These uh, basic values, basic quality, good quality, now must nurture to sustain and further strengthen it. Now here training our mind with awareness of the positive thing, usefulness. And then through that way, with effort, training, and increase these uh, qualities. Uh, this quality. Then, with help of training, with help of wisdom or awareness, then these uh, biased affection become unbiased, infinite. That's truly uh, loving kindness. Uh, so, now the previous one, there's a lot of unbiased, biased, or love, compassion, very much weaks with attachment. The second one, unbiased one, detach. So now here important is, firstly, realize the positive emotion, such as affection, compassion. At individual level, very important, bring more inner strength, inner comfort, with peace, peaceful mood, we can handle better all problems. Agitative mind, difficult, often become wrong method, wrong way, wrong way no. handling no. the problem. So, because logically, whether, so the, even you say harming other people, you should follow realistic method. Then effective harm, ha, harm, oh, counter measure, no? ha. effective measure. Oh, then more suffering, more pain can can put on them. If your method unrealistic, then the other may laugh at you. So therefore, uh, any action with certain purpose carried. Realistic way, the desired purpose can fulfill. It's it. Unrealistic approach uh, often fail to bring the result. The result. So therefore, therefore, in order to carry realistic approach, it is very important to know the reality. Agitative mind cannot see the reality. One my uh, American scientist about about mind. Uh, one time I met in Stockholm, in Sweden. And he told me when people lost where lost anger, anger. Uh, then the object which you feel angry, that object appears negative. So there. The negativeness, actually 90% of that negativeness is mental projection. Uh, this is exactly Nagarjuna stated. When our destructive emotion develop, the object, uh, the negativeness, much exaggerated. Similarly, attachment, also the, the positive, positiveness of that object also exaggerated. So, uh, with that, you can't see the reality. So then, uh, with that, any method, any sort of approach become unrealistic. 
So they are also calm mind, balanced mind, to look the object uh, from various ways, from different angles. Just one dimension, you can't see the reality. We must look from different dimensions. Different dimension. Then you can see the reality. Uh, then carry the, any action, become realistic action. So, calm mind, compassion brings calm mind. That helps to firstly open our heart to other. Through that way, uh, there's one thing. Then calm mind also provide our brain which can judge the reality, which, which can investigate about reality. Also, it's more effective. So the compassion brings two positive things. So, so that is suppose ethics, and then through that way, as I mentioned before, they really see now, according to this reality, whole world just like one entity. In previously, United States uh, isolated, and the European continent, each country, yeah, more or less complete independence. Now, today's reality, no longer that. Everything interconnected, interdependent. So, under that circumstances, according to that new reality, the concept of we and they is no longer relevant. Must look whole world as one entity, just we. So, the mind of compassion also, you see, immense helpful to bring that kind of, I say, the, uh, that kind of attitude. So, so since such things brings uh, more peaceful, more joyful, less problem, so it's called ethics. <laughs> so, that doesn't matter. No, no. So I think okay. Then question now. Question. So so one 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 thing. One thing I I want to tell you. The uh, I'm nothing special. I'm just another human being. Just like just like you. Uh, uh, so when you listen my talk, uh, you sh must feel oh I'm listening another human being, which we all have. Which are we, as just a human being, so we all have sort of same potential. potential. So therefore, uh, from that person's sort of experience, and relevant to yourself. If uh, the audience consider Dalai is something very special, then my talk become useless, because you see, oh, you feel oh Dalai is something very special. Uh, we can't do. Well, we can't we can't follow you see his experience that is silly <laughs> and sometimes you see, people even you see they believe dalam have some special sort of kasa healing, uh, uh, healing power right? or healing power so there are, uh, sometimes i told uh, since my operation so if i have real healing power then the surgery not necessary <laughs> 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 so they <laughs> So the surgery itself clearly sort of shows I have no healing power. <laughs> <laughs> so we are same. We are same. Uh, that is very important. Then we can communicate. Uh, and from my experience, you may get some benefit like that. That's all now. Mm -mm. <clears throat> Um, how would you advise college students who are engaged with social and political issues 
apply their passion for humanity to the world. Considering the inevitable corruption in all areas of life, government, state, state church, etc. And how do you not become uh. disheartened? How do you not become disheartened mm. by these continual disappointments? And if, peop if people do not or choose not to live up to your standards? Uh. Then firstly, <clears throat> our human society, uh, the negative things bound to happen. Uh, uh, at the meantime, even these corrupted people, sooner or later, they have to go. They will go. <laughs> so, they, uh, so you, college student, yeah. now you are the part of new generation. So the, uh, so as a result of found faults of these older people, my generation. Mm, or the chancellor also, I think, my generation. <laughs> <laughs> so my generation, in some extent, a little bit corrupted. <laughs> now, seeing their sort of wrong, rare, false, mm -hmm. now you yourself should not follow that and try to create new healthy society. That is your responsibility. <laughs> New healthy society uh, cannot sort of develop or cannot bring by government regulation, but from family, from individual. Healthy individual, mental healthy, uh, outlook wiser. Right? Uh, and then that way, and your family becoming more sort of healthier mental attitude, and byproduct, physical health also come automatically. Then one family, ten family, hundred family, thousand family. That means community, more healthier, more compassionate uh, community. One my Mexican friend once told me the zone of peace in their own area. Some family group, they, uh, cre they, uh, they create, uh, they create sort of in certain area, zone of peace. So within that is a quarrel, uh, sort of what's the uh, fighting. Arguments. No? Arguments should not take place. So that also, I think, good. Uh, finally, uh, our vision should be whole globe, whole world should be demilitarized, a zone of peace. Uh, but for that, step by step, we have, to, we have to create step by step. So your own area, some kind of uh, zone of peace. Within there, any problem, happen, must find peaceful solution. Problem there. But that way, I think, uh, and then also, I often say telling people, 20th century becomes century of war, century of bloodshed. Now, problems still remain there. So, uh, using violence in order to solve problems is wrong method. It proved. Therefore, now, in now this century, we should, we should make effort. This century should be century of dialogue. Uh, so, uh, so here, uh, in order to carry uh, this sort of vision, we need uh, external disarmament and internal disarmament. Internal disarmament. Which just I'm talking uh, to increase our affection, compassion, build 
compassionate family, compassionate society. Uh, then that kind of sort of motivation, that kind of attitude eventually, you see, uh, carry external disarmament. Okay. So therefore, this should be our vision. So the implementation of that is step by step, like that. So that's young people's sort of special responsibility. And you have, you have the chance, like that. Next question. <clears throat> Um, what is your view on conserving the natural environment from an ethical perspective? No, ethical or not, the, this planet is our only home. Uh, uh, and, of course, I'm monk, no children. But most of you, you have children, uh, grandchildren, so you have to think about their life. Uh, end of this century and next century. You have to think. So therefore, the environment issue and also our lifestyle. Now some connection to that. The consumerism. Always use uh, Consume. Uh, consuming, consuming, and luxury style life. The meantime, population increasing. Now here, I think uh, one one critical thing is the gap reaching the poor, global level, and also national level. One time in Washington, I expressed this is the capital of most richest country, but in Washington suburbs, uh, suburbs, suburbs. Uh, uh, suburbs, there are many poor people. So, we must deal this problem. So we must, re or this gap is not only morally wrong, but practically also source of problem. So we have to deal these, these things. So therefore, uh, uh, thinking, so new thinking, right? New look, our lifestyle, and including environment and the nature resources, and because of cycle just too. Recycling. Uh, Recycling. Re recycle. Recycling. Recycle. Oh. Recycle these things. I think these are. Oh, I think one one good news is uh, many years uh, many years ago. One time, uh, I was in uh, Sweden, in Stockholm. One my friend told me. Uh, sometime, some years ago, in river in Stockholm, you see, no fish because of too much pollution. Now they take a special sort of measure about the protection of pollution. Now begin appear some fish. And also one occasion in Germany. Actually, you see, uh, I visit some factory. Very clean factory, although more expensive, they told me, but the result or effect for environment is immense. So we have the technology, we have the capacity uh, without damaging Kaza economy. Money. Oh, yes, economy. without damaging economy, the fullest sort of protection of environment. So these are, I think, wonderful. So think uh, this line and implement, so because of these too many. Really so therefore, these are uh, meant for our next generation, uh, next, next generation. That, I think, uh, very important. That also some, some kind of ethical. Ethics, responsibility. Ethical, ethical yeah. responsibility, like that. I think the world, today's economic crisis, in a way, I think good lesson. This limitation. <laughs> oh. oh, many. Uh. Uh, uh, I, uh, many years ago, one of, uh, when Japan, their economy rapidly is increasing. increasing. So at that one occasion, I mentioned, uh, you cannot take for granted. You see, these uh, further develop. 
economic growth. Economic growth. So there is limitation. Sooner or later, you will reach some level, then no longer growth. Uh, so it is better to sort of what's that? to be prepared to 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 to, have, to get awareness of that limitation. So then, after some time, one occasion uh, in Japan, you see, then economic crisis is a start. So then, some my Japanese friend, uh, they agree, they fully sort of appreciate sort of my sort of comment like that. Comment. So now America, uh, I think no matter how much of crisis, economic crisis, I don't think any danger of starvation. I don't think. Then simple lifestyle, and enjoy yourself, and more human friend, or smile. Uh, right. oh. I think sometimes better. Yeah. You may find more time. If you become slave for money, then always you see, run here, there, here, and there. And also you see, thinking only money, money, money. Then also sometimes necessary to tell a lie, to cheat other people. Isn't it? Perhaps more because of the ethical life. Maybe better. So maybe God created like that. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so, so in any way, in any way, you see, some crisis happen. Then should not look just from one angle. Look from another angle. You may find some advantage. Then at least your mental burden reduce. Right. Good. Hmm? Um, these are some personal questions. Uh, do you live in the simplicity of Tibetan ways? Do you still eat Tsampa? Correct. Tsampa. Tsampa. No. Mm. And do you have a garden? Yes, sir. Do you have a garden? Garden, eh? And do you garden? Garden, she gives it. No. Mm. Yes, at Dhamsala, I have one, yes, uh, greenhouse. Right? A greenhouse and different variety of flower. I love flower. Uh, and sometimes the Dharamsala climate too much wet and hot. Uh, so some some flower, my favorite some my, some my favorite flower, like a delphinium, in Lhasa grow very well, but Dharamsala difficult. Uh, Otherwise, there's a lot of, and also different, different kind of new flower also there. So my, myself, gardening, now no longer. Just enjoy their color, their shape, and without touching. <laughs> <laughs> so let some other people do that hard work. labor way. Hard work. Ha. Hard work. Ha. Hard work. Oh, hard work. <laughs> So, I exploiting. <laughs> oh, Samba is concerned. Samba. Uh, oh, I think more than 20, 20 30 years ago, uh, uh, then I didn't, sort of, uh, I didn't have Samba. Uh, I, I did not take Samba. Samba. Uh, just bread. Like that. And then, uh, Tibetan, coming from Tibet, and then I advise, and also I learned some nutrition, nut, nutrition, nutritionists. Ah. Nutritionists. Nutritionists say the samba is very good for health. And later I found some Chinese also now fond to take samba. So therefore, I advise the Tibetan. Uh, one time, so one Tibetan who visited Lhasa, or oh, no, who visited in Kham area, and while he going and coming back, he spent some time in Lhasa. Then I just casually ask, what kind of breakfast? Then they say, breakfast with the Chinese style, what call called? Uh, shifen, they do. Uh, rice noodle, yeah. Oh. Rice porridge. Oh. 
then I a little bit of a surprise. But people in Lhasa, the Tibetan, now they, the food style, uh, also is changing. Uh, then I start take zamba. While I'm advising the other Tibetan, you should take zamba. So I myself felt must take zamba. <laughs> so, so at the initial, because I think at least uh, I think about two decades not touching zamba. So when the first first time zamba take, was a lot of problems, stomach. <laughs> Mm. What is, what was say? A <laughs> lot of things come from there. Uh, so then, uh, I adopt scientific way. Uh, one day, one spoon, zamba. That about two days, two three days. Then two more stom- spoon. Then uh, three, four, five, six spoon. Then eventually, okay. <laughs> So now, since then, I always take my breakfast, except in aeroplane. Uh, one one time, my German friend, uh, uh, I was a flight attendant, yeah. Uh, yeah. In aeroplane. So one, one time, he brought some samba in aeroplane. <laughs> I <Yeah>. surprised. <laughs> Otherwise, you see, except in aeroplane, uh, otherwise, I always carry my zamba, mm. uh, and, and actually, you see, one story, one story, or one was from, uh, this was back, very useful. When I take long flight, usually, you see, to me, breakfast is very, very important, because the previous day, no dinner as a Buddhist monk. Some occasionally, I take something. But usually it's no, no dinner. Therefore, next morning, I always feel hungry. So, in aeroplane, breakfast, some air, some air good. Some, quite poor. <laughs> no. So, therefore, I always you see, prepare some bread in my, uh, in, in my bag. bag. So, in Delhi airport, uh, some... Officials from the government in India usually uh, come, come to Khaza, to, Khaza. to receive me. Right? Uh, to, to, Khaza, uh, to see to me very off. Well. Uh, to see me off. Uh, uh. Yeah. So, because of the bread, you see, my, my back rather thick. <laughs> <laughs> so, then sometimes I explain, I show them, oh, this is my Khaza. breakfast. Khaza. The, the Tibetan word, tophe, tolu se pego. It's like a kind of a uh, a food sack. Mm-mm. So this, uh, not just a holy thing, but a practical thing, some bread <laughs> also here. <laughs> so, so I think here some Tibetans, I think eating samba is I think, very, very important. I think very good for nutrition and also for blood pressure, and some other, uh, I think the sugar, sugar level. Some people say yeah, very good for, for as a preventive, like that. And then, um, <clears throat> in the documentary "Unwinking Eye," it's a, it's a television documentary hmm. program. "Unwinking Eye," you meet with scientists concerning the interface between science and Buddhist practices, such as meditation. Hmm. However. You say that neuroscience is unable to truly understand the systems which underlie and integrate science and religious practice without understanding of reincarnation. If we as scientists are to explain phenomena from the perspective of physics, genetics, neurobiology and so on, what are the major philosophical and systematic, systemic issues that have to be dealt with in the sciences in order to make sense of reincarnation. Oh, now here. Yeah. Uh, firstly, uh, I always keep my, keep my mind uh, from my tradition. That's Buddhist tradition. 
from my tradition how much I can contribute for well-being of humanity. Never thinking how to propagate Buddhism. Now, meeting with scientists, discussion with scientists, the main motivation, not seeking some kind of backing. Confirmation. Or or uh, confirmation. Confirmation from science. Simply uh, sort of mutual learning. Explore. Uh, there are certain things which not that much detailed information in Buddhist science as far as material is concerned, matter is concerned. So very helpful to learn from them. Then science of mind is concerned, Buddhist or, or ancient Indian thought, quite rich. So we can able to uh, give them some information, new information. So I always say, make clear, our dialogue is not dialogue between science and Buddhism, no but science and Buddhist science. Buddhism divided three, three parts. Buddhist science, Buddhist concept or philosophy, Buddhist religion. So, the, uh, about rebirth or, or, or salvation. Nirvana. Nirvana. These things are Buddhist concept. Truly Buddhism. So, nothing to do with science. Science about mind, about emotion, and how to deal emotion on this conventional level. Like that. So, when we reach now a certain sort of concept, then I usually say, oh, this is Buddhist business. Uh, and also some my Christian friend, or late, for example, late father, uh, Wayne. Uh, um, brother Wayne. Brother Wayne. Wayne Teasdale, yeah. Uh, uh, he uh, very much sort of uh, showing interest about Buddhist practice. Of course, meditation, uh, practice of loving kindness, or forgiveness, these things. Yes, these are common. Then one day, he even, you see, uh, showing interest about Buddhist concept of selflessness. Then I told him, this is Buddhist business, <laughs> not your business. <laughs> so there's different sort of concept. So everything mixed is uh, uh, not much interest, yes, no. like that. So like that, so our sort of Kazuda, Dialogue. dialogue with modern science is Buddhist science, not Buddhism. Hmm? Um, <clears throat> my son, Renon, will be in the audience today, and he would like to ask Your Holiness the following question. Mm -hmm. How will I find my mom, my mother, oh. uh, my mom again when she dies? I don't know. <laughs> That's difficult. And practically also, uh, my own mother, I want, oh, where my mother? But I don't know. If you carry some special investigation, then, uh, but that also is not 100% sure. So better to leave it. That's my that's the, my, my feeling. My like feeling. That. Um. Hmm. Of course, unless clearly demonstrated convincingly by the child, okay. there are some. Ah, one time in Kanpur in India, I think UP, Kanpur in UP. Uttar Pradesh, uh, one young girl was brought by uh, her parent and clearly memory about past life. So that memory is so convincing. 
So even previous to parent, also now, because of the previous life, at the young age, girl, young age, because of accidentally died. Died as a result of accident. So the new birth, very clear about past memory. So therefore, the past, the girls or the parent, so I mean, because of the expression of the past memory is so convincing, the previous parent also accepted as their daughter. So one daughter, four parent. Now, such case is something exceptional, quite convincing. Otherwise, many of our lamas, turkus, uh, sometimes it's difficult. The previous uh, well-known, respected lama, the reincarnation, sometimes disgrace. <laughs> so I don't know. Really, I don't know. Hmm? <clears throat> um, my question is this. I'm trying to practice mindfulness and being in the present moment in a positive way. Hmm. How does one do this when your partner is doing exactly Karsa. the opposite? Karsa. <laughs> Karsa. <laughs> Karsa. <laughs> Um, so how does one mean remain mindful and positive without <coughs> being judgmental and getting emotional? Robert <laughs> I think that's why uh, one sort of varsity, uh, so that's why <coughs> for practitioners, one of the recommendations made is to have to maintain companionships of people who share the same kind of uh, outlook. Mm. <laughs> but then, then your, your friend, of course, the important thing is, because uh, a warm, warm-hearted person, then if that is there, then no problem. <laughs> uh, occasionally, uh, uh, get some permission from her, and you spend some time meditation. And if uh, a properly, because of the proper because of permission not come, then you should. So you need to uh, take into consideration her wishes and her uh, feelings. You should take uh, your wife as a, your teacher, your master, <laughs> at least in your home. <laughs> so should yeah, yeah. respect her. Yeah. Uh, should respect. <clears throat> Provided that wife is good wife, <laughs> then go that way. <coughs> so this is that is one kasa consolation survey. Consolation. Consolation for monk, celibate person. <laughs> now we are truly independent. <laughs> uh, the married person, of course, short moment very happy, uh, uh, but actually half your freedom lost. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, do you think it is possible to be a political leader and a religious leader at the same time and at the same time be effective at each job? Basically, uh, no Kasurda, contradiction. Where? Religious person, religious leader, at the same time, the political leader, as an individual level. But 
uh, as an institution, I think the former, at least the last, I think, nearly 400 years, the Dalai Lama institution uh, become head of both temporal and Religious. spiritual. I think that outdated. So therefore, uh, since 2001, we already achieved the political leadership must come through election. So since then, my position is semi-retired position. So that's much healthier. And the system, I think democratic system, in spite of some drawbacks there, but still, democratic way is the best way. So we also, you see, implement that. So I think as far as uh, democratization work is concerned, we small refugee community in India much advanced than people's part of China. <laughs> That's clear. <laughs> That's very clear. <laughs> I think um, that's all. That's, that's one last question. Uh, last last. One yes. I think f still. Okay. The f oh, um, 15 minutes. <clears throat> oh. My question is how does one stop the internal struggle and keep the peace in the face of stress, such as financial worries, relationship problems, and physical pain, and so on? Mm. When life becomes such a hard work, how do you maintain? a peaceful and happy heart. Mind, like matter, many <coughs> components, Ray. There are many, many components. Many components. Uh, even tiny flower, a lot of particles. Uh, then, you see, bring shape, color, life, all these things. So similarly, mind, not just one single absolute one, no. Many elements. So as I mentioned earlier, healthy mind. Firstly, of course, compassion, these things are important. Uh, and also wisdom or because of the intelligence, also very, very important role. Uh, then the each compassion, practice of com or training of compassion, and the training of, because of the intelligence or awareness, uh, many other elements. And then, as external thing, uh, the development of the flower need certain time. Time factor also important. So similarly, our mental change, transformation of our emotion, also take time. So the regular effort, Kasuda, consistently, consistent, very important. One short period, regular sort of training, then nothing, then again. Not good. Like flower, the watering sun regularly. Not too much. Not because of that. Too little. Not too little. So similarly, training of our mind, also quite similar. Uh, we take uh, various sort of aspects. Right. Yeah. Uh, uh, some Tibetan master say, so there's a Tibetan saying by masters who say that if you know, observing your own kind of mental states, if you recognize that there is a greater 
tendency towards kind of grasping at things to be permanent, then you need to apply the antidote, which is to reflect more on impermanent and transient nature of things. And uh, if you begin to recognize in yourself a tendency to take the kind of your own time, not that seriously, then it is important to reaffirm your awareness of the preciousness of the human existence. And the you know, existence as human being accords you the opportunity to recognize that preciousness. Similarly, if you begin to recognize in yourself a greater tendency towards grasping at your own self and ego, then again you need to apply the antidote to reduce that kind of strong grip on your own kind of you know, um, personal ego. So this suggests that the specific application of antidote corresponding to whatever problems there are is, is crucial. And like a physical health, the immune system, if immune system good, then some virus away. Viruses, love. Some viruses uh, may not disturb much. But if your immune system, basic bodies, element weak, then even, even the tiny sort of germs or virus, is it can create a lot of problem. Similarly, mental health is concerned. Your basic mental attitude is sound. Then, uh, such as these sort of unfortunate things happening here, 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 may not disturb much. But, you, but your basic mental attitude is weak. Then if tiny, problems uh, bring a lot of ups and downs. Uh, so now here, I think firstly, uh, I think uh, according to Buddhism or according to Jainism, which, uh, what's the, which concept of causality, causality. then uh, all facilities which we consider something positive, ultimately uh, all are under karmic or ignorance. That's what that. Dominant law. Dominant. Domination. So anything which domin under domination of ignorance is essentially suffering. So when we uh, face some problem, it simply indicates its ultimate nature. So nothing sort of surprising. The body, in spite of take maximum care, some problems. That shows its basic sort of nature, its suffering nature. That's Buddhist viewpoint now. There are three levels of suffering. Suffering of suffering, suffering of change, and suffering of... Conditioning. No? Suffering of conditioning. conditioning. Uh, so understand these things. Then there will be no surprise. Oh, it's quite natural. Isn't it? Now, for example, some people... You see, even the uh, avoid to mention death. The word death. The word the death. death. And also, you see, they uh, difficult to admit old age. More kasadi, nima. Wrinkles. More wrinkles and more difficulties. Oh, uh, some old lady, some old gentleman. Even their uh, knees, no knees, is it shaking, uh, shaking, difficult, but try to show or uh, perfect that way. So, uh, so that's unrealistic attitude. So here now, a person's attitude, old age, right from the beginning, this part of our life, and become old, feel happy. I live so long, and also the sort of age, each sort of each stage, stage, 
this is its own beauty. Young, very young, is beauty, I feel, very honest. They don't know how to tell lie. Very good. I think human positive quality, at that time, I think very fresh. Then, of course, then eventually, another level of life, or sort of more able, feeling of more independent, and can do more, that also is its own beauty. beauty. Then become old, a lot of experience, that also, the, it's beauty. So young one seek advice from their experience. So old people then can tell them advice from their own experiences. <laughs> Isn't it? But you see, the young age, there's drawback. Middle age, drawbacks. Old age, drawbacks. No, they should know that. When finally we have to go, that's part of our life. The logically, there is beginning, there is end. So nothing surprise. So therefore, mentally, knowing these things, then some problems happen. Then you feel, okay, okay, okay. That's quite natural, quite natural. I think that's important. I think, I think many Tibetans, generally, in spite of many sufferings, they usually uh, have the feeling or concept due to my karma. Less mentally, less agitation, less anger. So those unfortunate things uh, happen, not just pointing on this person, on this people, on this country create that suffering, that much less. Of course, among the conditions, uh, the people or country also involved. But uh, equally, my own karma involved. So then, the inten intensity <laughs> of anger to blame, much less. Result, much happier. So therefore, the basic mental attitude, healthy mental attitude, is very key factor. Then some problem here and there can handle more easily. The basic mental attitude is weak, then very difficult. So how to build healthy mind? And if you believe God, yes, think of God, uh, and certain things uh, generally consider bad, but there must be some reasons. God is uh, uh, full of compassion, full of energy. So that also helpful, isn't it? Then, non-believer, fact is fact. Uh, the Shanda Deva sort of advice, can just use a little. Um, <clears throat> this, that Buddhist Master, Master Shanda Deva gives an advice that if the problem is such that if there is a solution, uh, there is no need to uh, worry about it. If there is no solution, then, then there is no point in worrying about it. <laughs> oh. So that's a very realistic attitude. The things are beyond our control. But then too much worry, too much anger. It's foolish. And I accept that. So I think realistic approach is, I think, very important. <clears throat> and my own case, uh, of course, uh, uh, I, I, cannot, I cannot say, my, every my action is realistic, I cannot say, but basically, when some problems, you see, face, I always try to look from different angle. For example, we lost our own country. But me personally, the last 50 years, I think best period, to learn from others' experience. There are many uh, people who belong to different traditions. I had opportunity to learn from them. And opportunity to learn from scientists. Scientists. 
and also having meet, you know, opportunity meeting with various people, rich, poor, beggar, AIDS patient, or leprosy, right? Lepers. Uh, and a spiritual leader, very useful. Each time I can learn something, something. Gain experience. So if still I suppose in Lhasa, in Potala, in holy place, and remain as a holy person, I don't think uh, these sort of experience can, can, can get. So therefore, looking from that angle, of course, lost our own country, a lot of suffering inside Tibet. That's sad. Otherwise, me personally, very fortunate. So sometimes I really feel gratitude to Chinese communists. Mm. Uh, ultimately, they create using this opportunity. So good, like that. Uh, so looking from various angles. Uh, then another thing, one face problem. You must look at that problem from distance, from holistic way. Then that problem becomes smaller. If you just look at that problem closely, then immense. But from a wider perspective, six billion human beings there. Each one has some problem. I think here, a few thousand people here. If we ask each one, I think each one has some kind of problems. No single person who has no problem. And I think last uh, several sort of say, generations. Same experience. In the future, till humanity remains this planet, problem is endless problem. So, uh, that's the nature of life. That's the reality. So looking at that, uh, then your mind something Kazuta, opens up. Uh, something open. So helpful. So now for, I think, uh, exact time. All right. <laughs> so, good night. Mm. Okay. Okay. So, oh, yes, 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 yes. One, one thing, one thing I want. I want to say, uh, I want to thank organizer this opportunity and also thank the large number of audience you really because of the showing because paying attention uh, being attention i very much appreciate then particularly uh, in uni uh, your uni university which is some uh, program uh, study uh, buddhism and these these things also also is some tibetan sort of things i very much appreciate thank you very much thank you very much so, first and foremost, thank you, Your Holiness, for your visit to the university today. And on behalf of all of us present, um, I know that we all wish you a very, very long life, the best of health, so you can continue to teach for many more years to come. And I know that I speak for all of us here when I say that it's our sincere hope that you will come again and again to our community. <laughs> His Holiness has requested that we give a brief accounting of all the expenses and income from uh, this event, and we're happy to do that, uh, even though accounting is not my uh, forte, but here, here goes. Um, the pre-production expenses, including website creation, advertising, and ticketing, came to $62,500. The actual events on campus, including all production expenses, stage, sound, videography, lighting, labor, parking, uh, 
and food for Sangha workers and special guests, $142,600. Airfare for ground transportation, lodging, and food for His Holiness in the entourage, $62,900. Expenses related to security, $30,489 and post-production expenses, including audio and video editing and transcription costs, $9,000. The total expenses came to $307,587, and the total income from ticket sales, $372,340. This leaves a surplus of $64,753, and this amount will be sent to the Office of Tibet in New York for distribution to charitable causes identified by His Holiness. Thank you again, Your Holiness. And if th thank you again, Your Holiness. Please come again. And if uh, if you could all please remain in the auditorium for a few moments while His Holiness leaves, that would be appreciated. Thank you all for coming. Tonight. Thank you.